morning. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm, I'm really happily surprised, I have to say, to see so many uh, faces. Um, we were quite nervous about planning something on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, and we're really unsure if anybody would show up at all. But you do, and I'm really happy because I think we're heading for a very exciting day today. Um, before we embark on that, I would like to say some things in general. I see quite a few familiar faces, even people who have been here all days, which I, I find really, really great. And I would like to invite these people who have been here for um, the entire program to join us later. We will announce that for an evaluation and thinking back through it and what happened. And I will really um, uh, take their comments on board. I mean, they're the experts. They have been here all the time. They've seen it all. I see a lot of new faces, which is also great, wonderful. Um, as you know, we have been working for a couple of months on this project, Voice Creature of Transition. We had uh, two months of lectures and talks and performances at the Academy, preparing, looking at the voice from um, several angles, a diversity of positions, ideas. Um, what we are doing here in the theatre is something different. We have made, um, we have brought together works by the students, works that they produced around voice and their thoughts and their first explorations or sometimes explorations that were already uh, on track because it's something that is seen to be or proved to be quite dear and quite near to uh, many of the students. Um, so we have works of the students. I'm really grateful, I have to, see that, to say, that we had the opportunity uh, to do this whole project surrounded by um, works by the students and their research. Um, during the four days, each day had its own distinct character because we invited uh, four curators to really um, have carte blanche, as it's called, to take the floor and use this space, use this platform to um, research, to be experimental, to test their ideas, uh, to invite people to think through a set of notions without maybe programming something very strict and scheduled, but really using this as something that we do all together, together with the students as well, and uh, many of the tutors who also have been here these days. Okay, final day. Um, I will not introduce the program, the curator will do that, I will just introduce him. Before I do that, just a few practical things. Um, as you know, we have slots during the day. You, uh, we will have some new audience coming in for the second and third part. In the break, there will be Rietveld uh, broodjes, as we are announcing every day. Um, and at the end, the final slot, it's open to everybody. There is no entrance fee for outsiders. So if um, the people in the choir want to invite their friends and family to come and look at it, they're, they're welcome. We will open up for everybody. One announcement to make for uh, students in the foundation here who are part of the choir. There is a final rehearsal at four in the Rode Zaal, the Red Hall, which is down the corridor here. You can ask Nikos, whom you all know by now, uh, where that is. So four o'clock, everybody who is taking part in the choir in the Rode Zaal at four. Okay, without further ado, I'd now like to introduce Mark Beasley. I'm very happy he's here, all the way from New York, with his guests. Um, Mark Beasley is, um, was born in the UK, but lives in New York. Uh, he was trained at Royal College of Art as an artist. So um, he's now working mainly as a curator, writer, researcher. He's doing his PhD on voice, actually. And um, he's also still working as an artist. Um, he is curator at Performa, which is an organization in New York that um, puts up wonderful projects around performance in the arts. And he recently curated a program in conjunction with the retrospective exhibition of Mike Kelly's work at MoMA PS1. Mike Kelly, who was recently in the Stedelijk Museum here in Amsterdam as well. Um, he has been doing projects uh, at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, he did a project with Francis Stark and Mark Lecky, put a song in your thing at Abrons Theatre. And he writes for magazines such as Fries, Eflux, The Serving Library, and he contributed to many artists' catalogues. 
His first LP, With Big Legs, will be released in 2014 on Junior Aspirin Records. And I now want to warmly welcome Mark Beasley for his program of today. Must the song be a song? Hi, good morning. My voice needs water, I think, this time of the day. Um, thank you very much to Gabrielle for the invite to be here. And uh, to Nikos and Yurt, who, who've, who've been a tower of strength. I'm quite amazed by the schedule here, the program. I almost feel like I should go back to school to do something like this. It's pretty incredible to have to two months uh, to focus on one particular subject or material, the material of the voice. Um, I, I'll do a quick run through of what's going to happen today in terms of each of the, each of the sessions. Um, but first I wanted to introduce um, each of our singers, performers, presenters today. Um, firstly, Jonah Barbara, who I'll talk about a little bit. Um, in relation to one of her earlier LPs, who's an American vocalist and pioneer of extended vocal technique. I'll get to what that term means in a minute. It's, it sounds a little unwieldy, but in essence it means odd mouth sounds, I guess, which is an easier way to take it. Um, and then Nicholas Bullen, who's the founder of the band Napalm Death and Scorn, and was part of the pioneers who developed the Death Growl, and the genre of music called grindcore. And also does a lot of um, improvised vocal performances, which we'll be doing in the second session today. Susan Overbeck of the band No Bra, who recently toured with the Savages and was described as potty mouth poetry, which I really like that term, and was li um, listed best of 2013 in Art Forum, and I believe it's just released an album titled Candy on NYC's address label. And also Gelsie Bell, who's going to present three works today, um, one in the first session now, Stripsody, one in the interim between the first and second sessions, a piece called Bathroom Songs, which is as it sounds, it will take place in the toilets, Americans call them restrooms, in the women's restroom between the first and second sessions. And I, I, I hear it's very small, the female bathroom. I've not been in there, but <laughs> so <laughs> you won't all be able to fit in. What a huge bathroom that would be. So the idea is to circulate somewhat so people would kind of go check in for a minute or two and then um, disappear for a little while. I guess. Actually, if you do want to go to the bathroom, I'm not sure what you do. Um, so there are four, four presenters today. And in this, the first session, I was going to briefly introduce you to extended vocal technique and one or two of the key works that um, first caught my attention or I think set up what extended vocal technique or vocal extension actually is. Now, apologies, because I'm going to read from a text for a little while, and then I'll kind of break out and use my rusty vinyl playing skills to um, present different clips from different pieces of work. Okay, so we shall start shortly. Okay. And this table's got a real bounce, so excuse me if... It... Okay.
Okay, so that's Joan LaBarbera's circular song. To listen to circular song is to fall in step with the rhythm of another's breath. With the rise and fall of the chest cavity and the material quality of the voice as it moves from inhalation to exhalation. It's unnerving, a wave of sound that never pauses or catches breath, like being underwater without knowing on your surface. As the song progresses, the rhythm becomes less uniform, as shorter inhales equal louder expulsions of air. The voice shifts, becoming a croaky nasal tone, like a terminal patient struggling with their last breath. This particular technique, the vocal fry, utilizes what the Barbara terms as the crack of the voice, that catch and crackle in the throat that is sometimes experienced on waking from fitful sleep. I've had that for about a week. I think it's, it's called me smoking in Europe. <laughs> Circular song employs the breathing technique of trumpet players and is recognized as a pioneering work of extended vocal technique, appearing on La Barbara's seminal LP, Voices the Original Instrument. A record that includes multiphonic singing, the simultaneous sounding of two or more pitches, circular breathing, ululation, vocal fry, and the glottal clicks that become her signature sounds. La Barbara's investigation of the voice, our oldest instrument of expression, has little or nothing to do with language, but everything to do with the weight and material of the voice, its objecthood. Her first LP consists of a series of short vocal musical comp compositions, etudes that explore particular techniques. In the case of circular song, <coughs> singing in a mirrored cyclic form. As the Barbara suggests, circular song was about technique, but also about process, as with conceptual art of the time, the mid to late 70s, putting myself in a situation where I wasn't sure if I could get through the piece, challenging self through physical tasks. La Barbara's unique vocals connect many histories while touring Europe in the 1960s with composers such as Philip Glass and Steve Reich and performing predominantly in galleries. In those early days, Glass and Reich's on musical music found favor in art spaces rather than the concert hall. La Barbara encountered the work of her peers, Vito Conchi, Bruce Nauman, and Dennis Oppenheim. Reneging on her claustrophobic early training as an opera singer, she looked instead to adopt the mechanics of process-based art and minimal composition in order to develop the voice as a solo instrument. It was a synthesis of effects that drew upon the natural sounds of popular mezzo-soprano, Kathy Berberian, gasping, coughing, laughing, the scat singing of Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Torme, and the teachings of her mentor and collaborator of 20 years, John Cage. Her virtuosic un understanding of the voice saw her premiere a number of landmark compositions that included vocal parts written for her, such as Steve Wright's Drumming, Glass and Robert Wilson's Einstein on the Beach, and the title role in Robert Ashley's Tetralogy, Now Eleanor's Idea. So what are vocal extensions? also known as extra-normal vocals, extended vocal practices, or simply extended practices. It's the study and categorization of unique singing techniques. Described by the British composer Trevor Wishart as a struggle to retain what was, vocal extension looks to reclaim and extend the sonic peculiarities of the voice. The struggle to retain refers to the sonic and vocal range that all children have in infancy, roughly from three months to two years from fluting squeals to low raspy growls. These strange bubbling noises are a child's first attempt to be understood, to engage sonically with the world. They're also temporary. Soon rules will be learnt and the particularities of vocal range and language fixed. Infants have at their disposal capacities for articulation that not even the most gifted or polyglot adults could hope to rival. Vocal extensions are techniques arrived through non-traditional means, much in the way that Cage prepared the piano, in which the piano's timbre has been altered by placing objects between or on the strings, hammers or dampers. The voice is subject to new articulation. It continually evolves, spurred, la spurred largely by innovative method and the advent of new technologies and genre expansion. Recent developments with auto-tune have meant that EVT, well, vocal extension dominates the expression of popular chart music, 
through the retuned vocals of R&B to the underground and drastically slowed, chopped and screwed musical collages of the late DJ Screw. And I'll get to that a little bit. So I think my point is somewhat that the history is of a, a plastic arts and a vocal composition are very kind of um, intertwined somewhat. And in, in that sense, um, there's a kind of parallel history somewhat. And first for me, I think he found parity in the futurist and Marinetti and his demand for a vocalizing that would metalize, liquefy, vegetalize, petrify, and electrify the voice to ground it in the vibrations of matter itself, much, much as auto-tune does. The voice has a material form, M molecules that when vibrated in the throat act on the ear. If the voice can be thought of as the original instrument, then it follows that it is also the first material we play with. Can we think of the voice as a material like clay, paint or steel? It can certainly be stretched and pulled, modulated over time, as timbre shifts and accents are gained or lost. Additionally, as we move from analog to digital communication technologies, the voice is fractured and made alien to its source. Internet telephony, digital utilities like Skype and Google Hangouts, have a higher fidelity than older analog systems, yet they also produce a thinner and more flexible version of the voice. We are made increasingly aware of its elasticity as we hear a loved one's words taking on a flat metallic tones due to a bad Skype connection, which is super weird when it's your 93-year-old grandmother and you're calling her from New York. Um, but also kind of interesting. As the software falters, the voice drifts in and out, becoming phantom-like, haunted by the media that produces it. So today, and let's get to it, um, I just wanted to present a brief history. It's very much my take of vocal extension, particularly those songs or vocalists that have had some effect on me. Examples range from the classical avant-garde, free jazz and the blues, to British post-punk and grindcore, to American hip-hop and R&B, as well as ritual and glossolalic recordings and performances. What does it mean to perform through voice? From the moment a word or sound is uttered, it begins to break down, to dissipate and decay. As Maiden Dola has it, voice is a continual drama. There is a topological structure, a geometry and form outlined with the passing of air particles. Continually monitored, we hear ourselves and alter the voice, its structure, its geometry accordingly. It is via voice that we first communicate self through accent, timbre and articulation. We regulate what is leaving the body and how we are perceived. Voice is a primary manufacturer and staging itself. In short, it is our first performance. The voice is body, the voice is person. So what of singing? Vocal performance as a the music theorist Simon Frith has it, is the most taken for granted indication of the person, the guarantor of the coherent subject. For Frith, music is something that is understood through performance. It is an act of sociability, as reliant upon the listener, viewer, as it is the singer. Music is experiential. Listener and performer are in it together. Both are active. As Frith has it, listeners do not consume the performer, they consume the performance. If the singer's voice makes public the supposed sounds of private feeling, then these public gestures are consumed privately, fitted into our own narratives, our unexpressive repertoires, fitted into ourselves. Can the voice ever be anything other than performed? And so to vocal performance, and I guess the first is Jonah Barber and John Cage. The first example of... Um, a vocal extension, one of them, the, the most cited, I guess, is a work by the Austrian, com Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg, Piero Lunaire, from 1912. And it contains or uses this very kind of key technique, uh, Sprechstim, or Sprechsergang. You can pick me up on my terrible, terrible use of um, German in a minute. Um, I guess the way, maybe I'll play the clip, but the way I got, the way I got a handle on what Sprechstip was was when somebody said, oh, it's what Bob Dylan does. It's what Lou Reed does, and it, what, it's what Mark E. Smith from The Fall does, and it's also what Susan Oberbeck does as well, I guess. So, 
Here we go. I'm just going to play a clip. And sadly, obviously, I can't play. Oh, oh, Den weinen man mit Augen trinkt, ist nachts der Mond in Wogen nieder. Und eine Springflut überschwimmt den stillen Horizont. Um, so the goal is certainly not at all realistic natural speech. On the contrary, the difference between ordinary speech and speech that collaborates in a musical form must be made plain, but it should not be called singing or bring singing to mind either. This is what Schoenberg and how he describes um, the composition and the piece. Before that piece, the basic function of the voice um, within music was to carry a text or a melody. Um, post that, there was a kind of different relation. Vocal extension's breakdown of language finds parity, or further parity in the plastic arts. In the fracture and facets of cubism, and as briefly touched upon its clearest progenitor, futurism, Rousseau's intoner Ramori, his noise machines, gave a larynx to the accidental noises of the world. While Dada's anti-art tendencies, specifically Hugo Ball's sound poems, poems without words, deconstructed the word and treated it as matter to be torn apart. Borrowing from Dada's principle of indeterminacy, John Cage's music of chances, changes rather, from 1951 composed using the Chinese book of oracles, the I Ching, achieved compositional liberation for writers and performers. And it's here that we catch up with um, one of my favorite or preferred vocalists, Kathy Barbarian. Born in 1925 in Massachusetts to Armenian parents, Barbarian moves to New York City in 1937, where she graduates from Manhattan's Julia Richmond High School for Girls. While in high school, she's the director and soloist for New York's One Armenian Folk Group. And Armenian Americans, as I looked into it, roll pretty heavily vocally in, in America, and they include um, another of my favorite singers, Cher, and the leading gospel singer and friend to Johnny Cash, I don't know why that's important, but he was really all about Johnny Cash, uh, Dennis Agajanian. She went on to study music in Paris in 48 and Milan in 49. While at the Milan Conservatory, she meets Italian composer Luciano Berio. They marry in 1950 and collaborate for over 30 years. And I have a number of tracks uh, from Cathy, but the, the piece that I wanted to um, present it's a, it's a kind of key work sequenza oh uh, really? Oh, okay so you've heard it, well maybe people... okay, that's good scrap that, you see me, forget about it no, it's fine. Let's, let's try this
Tebe ko fari sam dobro, tebe 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 Okay, so from the classical avant-garde to modernist American composers and performers. That's Luciano Berrio, Paulina Oliveros. I have tracks for these people, but I, I think if I played everything, we'd be here till midnight. So um, I'll just pick those that seem key or pertinent somewhat. So this is Robert Ashley who in a career spanning half a century um, presented speech, the rise and fall of speech and the subtleties of vocal effect that amplification allows, essentially turning language into music. And it's a particular piece that I wanted to play, I think, that connects um, the kind of history of an avant-garde music with performers such as Nicholas Bullen and bands such as Napalm Death. And I think the thing that really interests me or I find exciting is this kind of trade between a kind of avant-garde um, form and pop genre. And by pop genre, I would put um, grindcore in there, I'd put R&B. I think by genre, and I, and I kind of keep coming back to this idea of what, what is pop, and I think it is tied to this idea of genre. As soon as, from, in, to my mind, as soon as there's a kind of um, a box in a record store that reads witch house or zombie rave, that's become a genre and has moved on and has become a form that's somewhat fixed. But I think with this particular work, and I'm going to play a little clip from it, Wolfman, for me what was appealing was that it, it had, actually, you know what, I'll play it. That's probably best. That's probably best. Let's do that. Okay, so that's Wolfman. Uh, described as an amplified improvisation, improvisation of vocal sounds, it consists of four components, minute variations of the mouth, tongue, lips, and breath. To be played alongside the accompanying Wolfman tape, a droning layer of found sounds. Sounds from the radio and past Ashley recordings. So Ashley would appear uh, dressed as a lounge singer, which at the time was the one, one of the moments that you would see somebody with a microphone or a um, amp, I guess, or a kind of, um, yeah, any kind of amplification. Ch speaking with Robert, he said, actually it was quite rare pre the mid 60s to see people with microphones, which I, I found really interesting. And it was in the mid 60s that um, decommissioned military speaker systems um, appeared in thrift stores in America and he was buying he was buying equipment to use. But essentially the Wolfman is a kind of soft exhalation of the breath into a mic up close, but with extreme, um, which produces this extreme kind of feedback in the room, which invariably would clean out rooms, people would leave. And when I, when I invited him to present it as part of a music festival I organized with Mike Kelly, he was actually he decided he'd retired the work, which I respected, and he said, that it was a piece made for a different time. Um, it was a piece made around, um, that responded to the kind of violent clashes um, between protesters and police um, in parts of the Midwest at the time, and he felt that it spoke to that generation, and taken out of context, it was read 
um, differently. But I think for me, and I know chatting to Nick Bullen, that that's, that's kind of a key, key work. It's also the first example of audio feedback ever used on a recording. I think in the same year the Beatles used a feedback in the first few bars of I Feel Fine. And then two years later than that, Jimi Hendrix started using guitar feedback. But I think that's another example of how these kind of um, things, are, things are in the air and are picked up and kind of traded between knowingly and otherwise, between different forms. Um, okay, speaking of pre-amplification, prior to a microphone, uh, musicians largely had to compete with um, the other instruments in a band or the 50 people in a bar who are all uh, drinking and kind of doing what we all do socially, um, having a good time, I guess so. And one of the key blues men for me that, uh, that was clearly key for that, what they call the British invasion, um, the uh, Rolling Stones and the Beatles in the 60s when they kind of traveled to America, um, they kind of brought back or took the blues, took the Delta blues, people like Howlin' Wolf, who they'd seen play uh, in these American musician festivals in Manchester in the north of England, particularly Howlin' Wolf, and they did their version of these kind of blues standards. But I just wanted to play Smokestack Lightning. And this is a recording from the American Folk Blues Festival, which is the first time that I think Mick Jagger sees um, the blues played, played live, and the rest is kind of here. Oh, the train I ride on. Sacrilegious, but I'm going to speak over this record. Uh, bear with me. <laughs> Terrible. Um, this is a um, piece by a um, American vocalist, a free jazz vocalist called Patty Waters. Um, born in 1946, and best known for her free jazz recordings on the ESP New York label. But as I was kind of looking at um, and female vocalist and vocal extension, Patty Waters was somebody that kept coming up and was kind of key, a key artist and musician for people like Diamanda Gallas and Patty Smith. And this is um, from her college tour LP. Basically, she toured colleges in 1966 in America and did, which was at the time quite a revolutionary thing, she produced a lot of um, kind of screams or extended uh, jazz versions of kind of um, jazz classics, I guess. I don't feel like I'm doing it justice particularly. But um, the kind of key work for her is this particular track, which she stopped singing on. 
Okay, I'm going to just leave that rolling. Um, another. So I started to become interested in this, this particular genesis of this DNA, and these particular singers, and this appealed. A lot of these LPs are kind of re-released now, which makes it slightly easier to actually get hold of them on vinyl. And I understand why MP3s are really great. <laughs> it's like trying to find out where tracks are on the vinyl as you're talking is a little tough. But here we go. So this is um, an album by um, somebody who's actually kind of peer of Hendrix, guitarist, Sonny Sharrock. And this was an LP that he produced with his partner at the time, Linda Sharrock. And it's an album called Black Woman. As a, I urge everybody to um, buy this particular re-release, it's on a label called Four Men With Beards, which really does worry me, because uh, I guess I'm the target audience, terrible. But it, um, in its completion, in its completion, as a whole piece, it's pretty incredible. But I was going to play part of a track called Portrait of Linda in Three Colors, All Black, if I can get the vinyl out and speak at the same time. This... It's a kind of subtle build <laughs> normally, but I had to go straight in there. And actually, the track before called Peanuts is this incredible guitar piece that I swear has influenced everybody I know who's a guitarist for the last 20 years. Okay, so I'm going to shoot ahead very quickly. I would love to play Yoko Ono's Fly, which is a key piece, but I wanted to get to some relation between technology and the voice. I'll play a bit of this piece. This is a piece by. Um, an album called Electric Lucifer from 1969 by a musician, or actually at the time he was a TV, children's TV presenter, and built his own kind of um, vocoders and different machines. He was kind of an early pioneer of um, electronic music, I guess. Bruce Hack, but he also, with his partner, who was his agent at the time, Chris Kachulis, I guess he was around. So Chris, who I've known and worked with, was the voice um, of this album, Electric Lucifer. <laughs> Superman. 
pajama. Fine. No, so that's, um, I guess that was the first time I recognized some moment of this thing in the charts. It got to number two, it's O Superman by Lorenz, and it got to number two in the British charts. And I remember being drawn to it through the use of the voice. And Lorenz was one of those people, I guess, in the 80s that managed to, well, not managed to, but crossed over from a kind of arts sphere, performance art downtown Manhattan to the charts. So I only knew her as a pop star, um, but I think in America she was, she was kind of um, understood through a different kind of um, field. But for me it was really interesting in that once I heard of her work through her pop music, I was then drawn into the other work that she produced, and particularly the kind of larger scale set pieces that she'd presented. Um, but again, that was um, an example of um, a kind of vocoder and use of vocoder. Okay, I was going to play a piece by Wendy Carlos, and she's one of my favorite, but I'm going to jump ahead. Okay, so looking at another genre, specifically hip hop, this is a track by the first MC. And. Um, to prove it, there's a plaque outside some um, block. In fact, it's 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx, which was kind of the birthplace of hip hop. But I'm going to let um, Coke the Rock tell you about it. Of this thing we call hip hop. We are the patent, everybody else is the product. 1520 Cedric Avenue is the birthplace place of hip hop. hop where you're rocking, you don't stop. It started on August 11th, 1973, in the Boogie Down Bronx. Later we moved the jam down the block to see the park where the lights got dark and you can still see hip hop. I'm gonna give you a little taste of the bass in your face to let you know if you was really in the place. There's not a man that can't be thrown, a horse that can't be thrown, a bull that can't be stopped, and there's not a disco that I hope the rock can't rock. <laughs> Cedric and see, see. So that's MC Coat the Rock. Um, and he, it's interesting to me how some of these genres are formed or how this music is, is kind of socialized as such. Hip hop essentially started at um, parties that were played out in rec rooms in the Bronx. And this particular party where Coke Rock and DJ Cool Herc first got together was a uh, back to school party for Cool Herc's sister, basically. So they bought the two turntables, uh, Coke Rock turned up, and basically his first kind of raps were just him talking to people that were in the crowd or telling people to move cars or the fact that beer was only 50 cents. But he kind of, um, he kind of developed his style of singing in this kind of very social atmosphere. They're also super savvy in that they, um, it was 25 cents for girls to get into the party and 50 cents for the guys, which was a kind of a pre-hip-hop awareness of uh, economies that was pretty, pretty savvy, I guess, is the deal. So Cindy's party was the birth birth of hip hop. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. It's a shame. To... Okay. So this is, um, somebody in the audience will recognize themselves as a young man. This is um, Napalm Death, um, who basically developed um, the style of music grindcore, which Nick's going to get to, so I'm really not going to get into it that much, but I just wanted to play um, it was for, the band was formed in Birmingham, 
three school friends, super young, too young to name a band, Napalm Death, I think, 12. How do you do that? I don't know. But, um, this is one of the tracks. DJ Screw, kind of southern hip hop, an example of uh, what they term chopped and screwed, which is where um, a track is played back at like a third of the speed or even less, and the vocals have been kind of slowed down um, accordingly. So he kind of developed this particular style of hip hop. But he picked it up from um, what are colloquially termed Chilombians, which is uh, Mexican. Um, audience who are, are kind of uh, very interested in Colombian cumbia music, I guess, is what you've seen. And it's been around since the 
uh, early 60s. But basically, they also slow down uh, this music, and they have a kind of vocal that responds to that. So we're going to play a, a particular track by a guy called Satanas, Satan. But he was particularly um, interesting to me in that he was a former obsessive, uh, he's like a heavy metal guy who was obsessed with Judas Priest, uh, particularly the singer, but he's kind of like transplanted that onto this already transplanted music. So this is, um, yes, yeah, interesting stuff. <laughs> Uh, this isn't Satanas himself. This is um, this is one of the fans. I uh, kind of subculture around it, but I really like. I don't know. There's something about this sideburn that kind of connects with. It's a kind of extension of like Teddy Boy's sideburn, Skinhead sideburn. I just like that there's actually the possibility of a like, subculture left in the world apart from on the internet. I guess. So they kind of appeal to me. As always happens, white kids listen to this music and they also slow down their sounds. This is Salem. And this is an example of a genre that I think had about a year to live and then died. Called Witch House, or Zombie Rave, or Dirge Disco. All righty, there you go. So this is, um, I'm just going to really speed it up. This is Attila Cesar, formerly of the band Mayhem. And I've worked with Attila often. He's a lovely guy. Sweetheart. That's a drink. Who doesn't? This is his project, Void of Voices. pretty impressive, it's slightly super kitsch and it like kind of takes um, Black Sabbath or sort to some kind of extreme in terms of a kind of theatre. Who else am I thinking about? that? Um, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive stuff. So from black metal to the Church Universal and Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Um, she was part of a doomsday cult, an American doomsday cult, and it's interesting, they released this LP of all of the invocations that they use, um, and to say it's a kind of coming against something through the word, through the spoken word, or through the kind of sung word, and well, this is the, the t this is the invocation and the judgment against and destruction of rock and roll. They don't like rock Please close your eyes at this time.
have time to kill. But I just wanted to play two last tracks. This is a piece by Stina Motland, who I think is very... It's kind of an interesting new generation of Norwegian vocalists that I think are very uh, informed by people like Joan, uh, Joan Barbara and uh, actually people like Dima de Galas. So I wanted to play a, a small fragment that wasn't BB2 pop music, but was actually, again, back in the arts sphere. <laughs> that looked at that connected so she played on the same bill as Attila Cesar and a Norwegian pop vocalist called Jenny Harbel who I believe is now touring with the Swans so it's kind of an interesting mix there um, I guess this image is here to remind me somewhat of um, the person that reconnected me or my interest in um, the voice as a sung Thing. I think as, um, as a curator, in the past I've done a lot of works that were more, or presented shows that were more, um, that employed the voice as a kind of narrative material, I guess. But speak, this is Mike Kelly, for those who don't know it, on the right. Um, that's a slightly schlubbier looking version of me, maybe, who knows. Um, so this is at a concert that we did, I think in 2009, it was called A Fantastic world superimposed upon reality. And it was a two-day experimental music festival that Mike had curated, kind of allowed me to co-curate, but it was really Mike's kind of DNA of um, all, the, all the influences, or his fandom, really, I guess, um, and connections to those experimental musics that went into his own music to a certain extent. He was in a band, Destroy Monsters, and the Poetics, both of which Mainly the poetics, I guess, use different forms of extended vocal technique. And it was Mike that I'd, I'd heard a, a couple of Joan and Barbara's tracks through friends, but it was Mike that really introduced me to, to her work. So, I, you know, I was incredibly indebted to him for that. But I did my first meeting with him at his studio. After me being slightly awestruck to meet Mike Kelly, we spent the next three hours rifling through his vinyl collection and uh, a number of the tracks I play, particularly the Elizabeth Clare Prophet, the um, um, Doomsday Cult music was presented to me by him. I didn't know, I didn't know the work. Um, this concert also involves um, a, a number of vocalists, um, chiefly Joan and Barbara, but also Shelley Hirsch. But I mentioned this, and this is the last track I want to play. Unless I play a piece by Reggie Watts, but maybe I'll leave that till later. Um, Mike, throughout his time, was very kind of interested in this connection between avant garde and pop, how pop borrows, whether it's Lady Gaga's flesh meat dress. There's got to be a newer example than that. I'm sick of hearing myself talk about that. Um, how these things kind of feed off each other. And I kind of see now in the visual arts that what's kind of happened is um, there's this kind of move, artists like Mark Leckie, for instance, is kind of looking again at things like Chopped and Screwed and how you kind of use those soundtracks within his kind of movies or his films. Mark Leckie's a British artist and um, makes a number of films with kind of sound, soundtracks. Um, yeah, 
that kind of connects to pop music. But I wanted to play a, a last track by Mike Kelly. Um, it's called Tijuana Hayride. And I, I guess it's a kind of perfect example of what he, what he came to think of pop music towards the end of his life, which was it was only good to flay alive and um, kind of like just twist its innards in and out. But I think this is a kind of good example of a mashup, quite literally, between two kind of vocal forms. Um, it's from, it's called Tio and My Hayride, and it's from his Days Done series. I don't know if they showed those at the show, but you know. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Oh, they actually had the installation, didn't they? I was here, I saw it. What am I saying? It was here. It was here, and it was at this one as well. Um, so you probably have heard it there. But somehow, yeah, this, this kind of spoke to me this particularly well. I'm just going to play this, and then we'll introduce... So do you think I've got half a shot of being a, a wedding DJ, if curating doesn't work? I feel like Whitney Houston, Nick, what do you reckon that's a mix beyond sublime? Um,